Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Larigakis, president of the American Hellenic Institute. And I welcome you all here this afternoon to another presentation of our HI Virtual Speakers Forum. Today's topic, the Eastern Mediterranean policy under the Biden administration, an analysis after the first year. And as always, we come to you live from our Hellenic House headquarters here in our nation's capital. Since the Second World War, the US and its Western allies have endeavored to build and perpetuate a stable and liberal world order based on the rule of law. Respect for the territorial integrity of nations is a central pillar of this world order. Unfortunately, as events have unfolded over the course of the last week and what the world has been focused on and rightfully so, are the horrific images and the humanitarian suffering that are coming out of Ukraine by virtue of Russia's illegal invasion of that country almost a week ago. And while we prepared for this presentation today, we were not sure that this was something that we would be experiencing. The realities are nonetheless the realities. But we will try today as much as possible adhere to the theme of our discussion. However, we cannot ignore uh, what is happening in Ukraine and the suffering that's taking place today, and ultimately the impact that the war in Ukraine and what ultimate impact uh, US foreign policy from here on out in the Eastern Mediterranean will be because of, of the war that we see unfolding before our very eyes. And while again, the temptation will be to more move in that direction within our discussion, I urge all our speakers here today to try as best as possible and deal with the theme uh, of the topic uh, of, of, of today. A year ago, we held a forum to explore the topic of the new administration's foreign policy concepts in the Eastern Mediterranean. My question at the time was, will the Biden administration view the Eastern Mediterranean through the same prism as the then Trump administration? And if so, would it, be, would it built upon engagement with the region, and in particular with Greece and Cyprus. I believe we came away with a generally hopeful outlook, especially because of President Biden and his national security team's known track record and familiarity with the region and the policies of the Greek American community. But after one year, we have to ask if this has been the case. For US policy toward Greece, a country that prides itself as a vanguard of Europe as a linchpin of regional stability, and security, we continue to see enhanced defense and security cooperation as evidenced by a renewed mutual defense cooperation agreement, the enactment of the US Greece Defense and Interparliamentary Partnership Act, and ongoing joint military exercises and military equipment transfers. All these developments are to be commended, but can more be done, especially in other facets of the relationship. For US policy towards Cyprus, February's high level reception in Washington of new foreign minister Ioannis Kasolidis was certainly welcomed and demonstrates that Cyprus is a valued strategic partner in the Eastern Mediterranean. However, is the US any closer to fully lifting its arms prohibition on Cyprus or to taking other meaningful next steps to enhance the US Cyprus relationship? Interestingly, when it comes to the administration's East Mediterranean policy, as it pertains to Turkey and to the three plus one framework, that has gained attention. Overtures to appease Turkey with talks of F-16 sales in the aftermath of sanctions levied at the tail end of the previous administration for its acquisition of Russian S-400s, a perceived passive engagement on Turkey's aggression and provocations against Greece and Cyprus, and a reversal of policy on the East Med pipeline to the delight of Turkey are examples that come to mind. What do we make of these actions and are more similar ones forthcoming? We've assembled an expert panel with extensive knowledge of the region to share their analysis and where we are after the first year of the Biden administration. They are Doug Bandow, senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, Doug has also was a former assistant, uh, uh, assistant, special assistant to President Ronald Reagan. He writes weekly columns for the American Conservative Online and antiaward.com. He has published has been published widely in such periodicals as Foreign Policy, National Interest, Time, Newsweek, Fortune, 
as well as leading newspapers, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. Dr. Michael Rubin is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. He also regularly teaches classes at sea about Middle East conflicts, culture, terrorism, and the Horn of Africa to deploy US Navy and Marine units. He is also a former Pentagon official. He is the author, co-author, and co-editor of several books exploring diplomacy, Iranian history, Arab culture, Kurdish studies, and Shiite politics. Dr. Konstantin Avanyutopoulos. He's the Konstantin Karmalis Chair uh, in Hellenic and European Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's a former Minister of Education under the Conservative Government in Greece and Professor of International Relations at the Department of International and European Studies at Pandion University in Athens. He is a graduate of that same university and holds an MA and PhD in International Relations from the School of International Service at the American University here in Washington, DC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our panelists. I welcome you one and all gentlemen. And without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the attention to our first uh, speaker here today. And that will be you, my good friend, Doug Bandow. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Nick. It's a great pleasure to be uh, joining this panel. Uh, it's a great panel and it's an important topic. Of course, as you indicated, when the panel was planned, uh, we didn't be, expect to be talking about these issues in the midst of a war. Thankfully, uh, that war has not yet directly affected the Eastern Mediterranean. Of course, it could with the issue of the Black Sea and naval maneuvers. Uh, we have not gotten to that, thankfully. It, um, but there's still very important issues to discuss. You know, the issues of the Eastern Mediterranean are with us uh, you know, constantly. And it intersects the Middle East, Europe, Central Asia, uh, you know, at the center, I think, of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean issues are usually uh, Greece and Turkey. Uh, they're not the only participants, of course. Uh, and unfortunately, Turkey seems to be uh, the most important participant, very often in a negative way. Uh, what I want to do is just very quickly run through some of the issues you know, we see and then have, we can you know, have a much more detailed discussion after, after that. You know, but if you look at issues of Turkey, this administration promised, for example, a focus on democracy. Uh, you know, Turkey is a major problem in that issue, both generally how it treats its own citizens. It has State Department employees in custody, uh, you know, people who work at uh, the U.S. Embassy. It has uh, the philanthropist Osman Kavala as well in prison, constantly ordered released by the courts, stuck there. Yeah, and the administration at least uh, did not uh, you know, invite uh, Erdogan to the uh, democracy summit. And he, Erdogan did not get his phone call from the president until October. So that was at least a symbolic gesture of um, you know, displeasure. The problem is uh, what will happen upcoming next year are elections. This I think is going to be the big test of the Erdogan government. Will it actually allow free elections? You know, when it lost uh, the Istanbul elections in order to rerun, uh, at the moment people figure he would lose. So this is an area that this administration needs to be active in. Uh, I'm not sure if in the you know, current crush of activities they will. NATO uh, membership remains very important, the S-400s. You know, the uh, inconsistency of having Russian uh, you know, anti-aircraft weapons while wanting to participate and purchase U.S. Uh, aircraft is obvious. Uh, there have been other issues of them, you know, Turkey blocking plans for the Baltics and, and Poland, whether one can trust, uh, you know, Turkey if NATO would come to clash with Russia. I mean, this is something which, you know, the Ukraine issue can bring to the fore. Uh, you know, I mean, this brings in the whole relationship with Russia. You know, it's not entirely pro-Putin, but that's clearly one in which causes concern for us, whether Turkey will enforce uh, new sanctions that have been placed on Russia, and how tough will the Biden administration be with Turkey. Uh, we continue to have problems uh, in terms of Syria. There's a broader issue of what we want to do with Syria and how to try to stabilize it. But separate from that is uh, you know, a Turkish uh, intervention in Syria against the Kurds, you know, Kurdish forces that worked with the US against ISIS. It continues to occupy territory. There have been a lot of human rights violations, et cetera, there. Uh, we still uh, see the issue of the Hulk Bank, the uh, sanctions case of the state-owned Turkish bank, where Turkey did an awful lot to put pressure on the Trump administration to try to change the you know, verdict there. I, don't, I haven't seen any activity there. I think this administration is very unlikely to get involved in that. The president did recognize the genocide of Armenians, and that obviously caused some hardship 
in uh, Ankara. So that was one area, I think, of a significant victory uh, you know, compared to the Turkish stand. It, energy issues in the Eastern Mediterranean that get tied up with Cyprus, you know, very critical issues here, which, uh, you know, unfortunately, Turkey has thrown its military might around. This affects Greece, it affects Cyprus, affects Israel, energy production, one in which the administration has not been, you know, terribly active in a way that I think most of us would like. Issue of Libya, where Turkey has been involved, again, wanting to extend its reach and using that for boundary issues. And uh, of course, Greece, uh, you know, the, the ever-present challenge for Greece in terms of territorial issues uh, with, you know, the kind of buzzing of, uh, you, know, you know, territory that is owned by, controlled by Greece and everything. You know, so these issues remain, you know, ones that are fraught, ones which the administration doesn't seem to want to, to get involved with a lot. When it comes to Greece, I think there is some good news. I think the general relationship has been a good one. Uh, we've certainly seen, uh, you know, in March, uh, the phone call came for Greece, so seven months earlier than Turkey. I think that is symbolically very important. Uh, Secretary Blinken uh, you know, called uh, you know, Greece a pillar of stability and a, a reliable ally. On the defense side, it's good. The mutual defense cooperation agreement, I think, was significant. You know, expanding cooperation and moving to bilateral as well as NATO cooperation uh, between the militaries. I think the downside is the continued issues of uh, you know, Cyprus and of territorial claims, the ones that I mentioned with Turkey in these areas, you know, Greece is victimized by a nominal ally, uh, you know, in ways that uh, you know, really should be utterly inconsistent for an alliance, it's inconsistent for the European Union and for how countries should treat one another. And certainly questions have been raised about the new uh, ambassadorial nominee, whether this will be best for the relationship. Um, you know, there are certainly ways in which the administration could do more so I think uh, it, it has not done badly necessarily. It simply hasn't done more that would have been helpful. And then there are a lot of other issues for the Eastern Med. I mean, the reality is this is a complex issue. Libya uh, remains uh, you know, kind of thankfully not at civil war at the moment, but with two governments and having trouble organizing elections. And you know, still many parties have intervened there. Syria remains under sanction, you know, a tragic situation with uh, Iran, Russia, you know, remnants of ISIS involved Turkey as well, Israel, you know, a mess that there's no obvious outcome attempts to move the political process forward really have stalled. The question of Iran, where the administration has focused its attention on getting Iran back to the JCPOA, which might happen. And there's a lot of criticism of it, obviously, uh, but that remains in the works. Uh, some people thinking it's likely to happen, but in my view, nothing is certain until everything is signed. And of course the issue of Israel, which is in a better position, I think, than in the past with the Abrahamic Accords, with a friendly relationship with uh, the administration, having its own political issues at home with a very fractious political system. And then a Middle East that remains complicated with Iraq, Lebanon and financial crisis, uh, issues of the Gulf countries, et cetera, terrorism. All of that is kind of there, which uh, you know, never goes away. So these challenges are going to be with us. An awful lot is there. I mean, I would argue that the administration has not necessarily done badly. The problem is inadequate attention. And in part, I think that reflects that it's a mess in terms of domestic policy, domestic initiatives, domestic politics, worried about the upcoming election, internationally trying to focus on China, today focused on a war in Europe. It's been very difficult to get the administration to pay the attention necessary to the Eastern Mediterranean to give it some serious diplomacy and look at ways to challenge and, and even confront countries like Turkey over issues that should be of concern to us. And I'll stop there and let our, the other panelists in. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and before we turn to uh, Michael Rubin, I just wanna remind our audience, if you have a question, uh, please use the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom and uh, submit a question that we can uh, ask of the panelists uh, uh, at the end of their presentations. Uh, Michael Rubin. Well, thank you. Let me start by saying I largely agree with Doug. It's not something that um, I often say. Um, it's also the wonders of Zoom that this morning, Doug was sparring with my wife on a different issue uh, on a Zoom call from Udaipur, India. Um, and so you've got a situation where maybe one Ruben Bandau um, debate during the day is enough. So let's just approach the issue from a slightly different way. First of all, I've got to say, I'm pleasantly surprised as I, as I survey the scope of American foreign policy and realize without casting blame in what a poor situation we are through much of the world, um, that 
the fact that we have bipartisan consensus broadly when it comes to the Eastern Mediterranean really shows the strength that derives when behind the scenes, congressmen, senators, the White House, other officials work to create that consensus. And so when it comes to Greece, when it comes to Cyprus, when it comes to the broad changes in the Eastern Mediterranean, we're on very solid ground now, simply because whether it's Donald Trump in the White House or whether it's Joe Biden in the White House, they can broadly count on the consensus of Congress behind them. It's not one of these um, national security football games where an administration comes in determined to do the opposite of what its predecessor did. And so that's largely the broadest change of the last uh, 20 years when we look at this. You know, the former um, Turkish ambassador to the United States, Namak Tan, um, had once said that the strength of the Turkish um, American caucus in Congress was really the metric by which to judge the strength of Turkish influence in Washington. And now we've gone from, I mean, basically 200 members of Congress in the Turkish American caucus to they no longer put it online because they're afraid to acknowledge they're probably under three dozen right now. So this really does show where the, I mean, the trends that we've seen over the last couple of years. And when it comes to the actual specifics behind those trends, I agree with Doug, the mutual defense and cooperation agreement is a good thing. And the Biden administration deserves credit, something also I don't say that often, um, for changing the review period of this from once every year to once every five years at a minimum, and quite frankly, um, a situation where this agreement might exist into perpetuity until there's a problem where it needs to be revisited. It's useful because if we don't have to redo this every single year, then we can actually focus on building the, the relationship rather than simply rehashing where, where we are right now. That said, I will be a little bit um, critical. When it comes to Ukraine, I don't want to talk that broadly about Ukraine, but what I would say is going back at least to the George H.W. Bush administration, every single president, Democrat or Republican, uh, has had his foreign policy legacy defined by the crisis which no one saw coming during the campaign. So with George H.W. Bush, of course, it was the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Um, Bill Clinton defeated Bush by saying, it's the economy, stupid. He was gonna be a domestic president and yet found himself in multiple wars in the Balkans. I mean, George W. Bush was also gonna be a domestic president. 9-11 happened, we found ourselves in Afghanistan and much more controversially in Iraq as well. Barack Obama wanted to quote unquote, end stupid wars and not only did we remain in Iraq and Afghanistan, but we were also in Syria and Libya. Now, Donald Trump, you could say, um, may stand aside from this unless you want to count COVID as really um, being what hit him from left field and defined his legacy. And with regard to Biden, it's clear that Ukraine is the issue right now. Now, the lesson I would derive from this is that um, we need to recognize that we need to have a strategic, um, a, a, a strategic scaffolding in place before the crisis actually hits. We're at our strongest also when we have in the options, the, the a panoply of options in our quiver. And if we wait, as frankly happened during the Clinton administration, um, to look at our military options until the crisis is already underway, we severely limit our options. So this is where I'll criticize the Biden administration. I think turning our back on Skiros was strategic malpractice. Ditto when it comes to Limnos. When it comes to Skyros, and excuse my pronunciation, I've actually never been to Greece or Cyprus, you've got a situation where the administration was saying, well, we don't want to put our co-locate our forces um, on that island because it's too close to Turkey. But it's not too close to Turkey. It's smack dab in the middle of the Aegean. It's not right on Turkey's borders. And so this notion actually perhaps um, suggests that we are bending over backwards a little bit too much in order to accommodate Turkey. And that also can be dangerous because it can be empowering to Turkey. We should treat our allies as our allies and not do what Donald Rumsfeld did. Um, I mean, Donald Rumsfeld vocalized this notion of we don't want to have an old Europe and a new Europe where old Europe's what we're really willing to defend and new Europe is where, well, 
it's the second tier. We don't want to do that in the Aegean Sea where we have the old Aegean Sea and the new Aegean Sea. So I do think that we need to have our strategic architecture in place before the crisis occurs. And Greece has been quite forthcoming on that. Um, at the same time, one of the things that I do think every administration needs to pay closer attention to is we shouldn't be using Greece or Cyprus as fodder for unrelated diplomatic deals or to coddle Turkey um, or to encourage Turkey along. You know, we like to think of ourselves as very culturally astute. But too often, again, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration, we don't realize when other countries are playing us because they are as culturally astute and understand how to play America, Americans and our sense of uh, grievance and so forth like a fiddle. And so let me give you an example. I don't think that, uh, I mean, Biden, Biden was criticized when he reached a submarine deal with the Australians vis-a-vis -vis China. And as a result of that, he decided to give a consolation prize to France and Emmanuel Macron to the tune of $5 billion. Well, we had been working with France behind the scenes um, on a deal to have some joint shipbuilding operations to help uh, create a shipyard in Greece. Now, it's all well and good to sell France the frigates, but it shouldn't come at the expense of Greece's broader um, financial and geostrategic um, importance. And so in this case, that's just one example of how we are uh, pivoting or, or using Greece as a chit when, when we really shouldn't. And the same thing is true when it comes to the East Med gas pipeline. You know, the administration can say that the East Med, Med gas pipeline wasn't um, economically viable. Well, first of all, I wouldn't trust the government ever, and this is where the libertarian streak in me comes through, to decide what's economically viable or not. Let, let the free market decide that. But from a strategic point of view, the reason why we, in our non-paper, we were actually contradicting some of our previous statements wasn't because of financial viability. It's because some people in the State Department thought this would be a good way to sort of draw Turkey in and, again, President Erdogan is playing us like a fiddle on this. Now, I worry also in the Eastern Mediterranean, looking ahead, because too often my criticism of US policy is we're very reactive rather than proactive. We don't want to replicate the Cyprus model. And by that, I mean where we take something which is fundamentally unjust and illegal, but because of the inertia of the other side, in this case, Turkey's occupation, of Northern Cyprus, make that the new baseline for negotiation. We don't want to have a situation where we create, um, where we encourage parties to take more extreme positions because they know the compromise will always come somewhere in the middle or where they have the decades in order to establish facts on the ground. The fact of the matter is there's no way, shape or form that Cyprus should be occupied today. It is an act of aggression. It is illegal. It's the pillaging of resources. And it should be a bipartisan interest to compel um, the withdrawal. We don't want to send a signal to Vladimir Putin that what Turkey has done in northern Cyprus is what he can do in Dunbansk, um, Luhansk, or for that matter, the rest of Ukraine. We don't want to be in a position 20 years from now where people are saying, well, the damage is already done, and so we just have to face reality. Um, and along that line, I would also say, when we look at what Cyprus um, needs right now, we need to look at Cyprus's real need to defend itself. Um, we need to look at provision of non-lethal goods. Another, um, I mean, not beyond the provision of non-lethal goods to real defense, for example, anti-drone uh, defenses and so forth. We don't want to be in a situation, and again, I go to being reactive rather than, um, where we should be proactive rather than reactive, where we wait until the invasion happens, and in this case of Cyprus already has, before we start talking about what's really needed. That's where we are right now with Ukraine. And we shouldn't repeat our mistakes in Cyprus. We need to be more proactive there. But let me turn the floor back over. Hopefully I've been proactive enough that we can have lots of back and forth in Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, last but not least, I'll turn now to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Arvanitopoulos. 
Costa. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be in the same panel with both Doug and Michael. And I, um, I mostly agree with uh, what has been said. And let me just give you my angle of the uh, Biden's administration policies in the East Med and um, what, is, what lies ahead. Uh, I, I would make the first remark um, regarding um, uh, the lack of a grandiose design. Uh, we haven't seen a major policy initiative in the East Med by uh, the Biden administration. Um, and, um, you know, we, um, we knew that in the past in the, um, in the East Med and the Middle East uh, during the Cold War years, uh, we had the dividing lines along the ideological and geopolitical uh, camps. Uh, after the Iraq war, we had a different Middle East. We had a grandiose design on uh, a grand design on the part of the United States, the neocon project about the democratization of, uh, of, the, Middle East, of the Middle East and so on. But since then, and um, the, over, the last, over the last 10 years, I would say, the perception has been that um, the policy of restraint of the, uh, of the American, of successive American administrations uh, has meant uh, the withdrawal of the United States from the region. And, and that, that perception was reinforced by um, the Syrian uh, issue. And of course, by the return of Russia that uh, played a, a, a role in the, uh, in the survival of the Assad regime and so on and so forth. Now, I do believe that the tectonic changes that um, uh, are going to be happening as a result of uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine uh, and the new dividing lines across uh, the, you know, democracy versus authoritarianism are going to affect the region as well. But having said that, I think uh, I can outline uh, elements of continuity and change in the Biden administration's policies in the East Med. Con let's talk about continuity first. Um, uh, both speakers refer to the the new spring in the um, Greek-American relations, and, and this is true. And, uh, and this is a result of um, uh, the US administration's policies, but also a result of the fact that um, Greece in many respects is not the, from being the problem has become the solution, from being part of the problems of the region has become part of solutions of the region, coming out of the financial crisis and, and uh, signing um, the compromise agreement with uh, Northern Macedonia, uh, I think Greece um, sort of became, you know, uh, a state that uh, wants to promote peace, cooperation, and, and, and find so peaceful solutions to problems in the region. And that was reflected in, uh, in also in, um, in US policies vis-a-vis -vis Greece. And I think that um, the um, the evolution of Greek-American uh, relations is, is, a is, a positive, uh, is a positive policy for both the countries and the region. Um, we have a, a, a very remarkable um, and significant uh, um, uh, military presence on the part of the US. It's not, just, it's not just a new defense agreement that, as Michael very correctly pointed out, that is not going to be um, renegotiated every year, but it, it's been signed for a span of five years. But it's also that the military presence of the United States in Greece has increased with a number of bases, which means that um, the strategic location, the strategic and geopolitical significance of Greece has, uh, has increased. That's number one. The, the second part has to do, and, and I think that fits with the new dividing lines along the um, uh, democracy uh, authoritarian divide that um, with the um, support of the United States, Greece has actively promoted the regional partnerships of uh, American allies that are, working, uh, uh, that are working together to foster cooperation in the East Mid. I'm talking about the Israel-Cyprus-Greece issue that um, uh, also uh, has the US participating in this trilateral partnership uh, in a three plus one kind of, of agreement. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, this, this new dividing line that's being formed along, you know, democratic states and authoritarian states are, is going to affect the Middle East uh, in one way or another. Uh, 
Um, of course, uh, as in the Cold War, we are going to see strange bedfellows in many occasions. There's not going to be ideological purity in, uh, in all the uh, constellation of uh, powers that we'll see in the future. But nonetheless, we are going to see elements of this dividing, ideological dividing line affecting the, um, the, um, the issue of the, East, the, the, the region of the Eastman as well, which brings me to the elephant in the room that both, uh, both the speakers touched upon, and this is Turkey. And, and, and here we have um, an interesting case in many respects. Um, uh, you know, Turkey in the post-Cold War era uh, started distancing itself um, uh, for many reasons. Uh, the, the, most pivotal, the, most, the most important reason was that it didn't feel restrained or uh, the need to be dependent upon the Atlantic Alliance anymore in this new polycentric world environment. So Turkey was sort of cherry picking, uh, and, uh, looking at its foreign policy in, on an ad hoc basis, uh, converging with Russia uh, where it saw fit, converging with China where it saw fit, converging with the United States where, when, where and when it saw fit. Now, uh, this new environment um, that we are entering, which I believe will resemble the new the, the Cold War environment, will, um, will make Turkey, will force upon Turkey the need to make choices. And we saw a choice being made by Turkey um, uh, the day before yesterday. Um, Turkey for the last 10 years has been a revisionist uh, power in the East Med, talking about the uh, the need to revisit um, even treaties like the Lausanne Treaty. And yet the day before yesterday, um, Turkey said that now we have a war which gives me the power to, um, to restrain passage through the Straits to, uh, because of the Montreux Convention. So the, the, the new situation is pressing uh, Turkey to, uh, to make choices. Um, that, be, that being said, um, uh, and, and, and my... my um, guess is that Turkey will, will be closer to the West in these new dividing lines, but not entirely. Uh, that, brings the, that, that brings the other question around, the question of Erdogan. Erdogan has been almost 20 years in power, and it seems that his reign is coming to an end, and um, uh, the new administration, the Biden administration or the next administration will have to handle the transition to something different. It's not going to be an easy transition because um, um, the, Erdo Erdogan uh, has, has uh, brought about the social transformation in, uh, in Turkish society and polity uh, with elements of anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism that, um, that uh, will impact the successive administrations. So Turkey is, is, um, is uh, I think, a, a, is a state to watch. The Biden administration's policy towards Turkey is from the old uh, textbook in the sense that um, uh, Blinken uh, has indicated that we need to try to keep Turkey in an orbit around the West. There is nothing wrong with that. And Greece, I think, would be the first to join the club in, in, uh, in having Turkey orbiting around the West. But we do know that Turkey won't be the secular democratic um, uh, pivotal state that would serve as an example to the region anymore. And we know that Turkey won't be a reliable ally anymore. Having said that, I think that for all intents and purposes, we, we all have an interest to keep Turkey in, uh, in a Western orbit. Now, uh, let's talk about the, um, the elements of change now. I think an element of change is the administration's uh, a willingness to renegotiate the uh, nuclear deal with Iran. Um, but it is very interesting to see how that will end with all the changes that are taking place now uh, with Russia and the Iranians. And uh, that's, that's going to be interesting to watch. But this, was, this represented an element of change, I believe. The second has to do with energy. And then Michael alluded to that. Uh, and let's say that the major issue that comes out of the, uh, of the conflict now in Ukraine is, is Europe's dependence upon, uh, um, Europe's energy dependence upon Russia. And this is something that has to stop. And uh, uh, I think the, um, the change of hearts of the German administration, the German chancellor is a welcoming gesture. But we need to go further than that. And we need to uh, cancel Nord Stream 2. 
uh, Europe uh, already has started to, to, to increase the, um, um, the imports of LNG from the United States. Um, uh, we almost uh, reached, I think, record levels of about 400 million cubic meters per day. And, um, and I think we do have uh, the ability to do more in that. But not that. But that's not the only. Um, uh, that's not the only way to diversify uh, energy for uh, for um, our European economies. The second had, had to do with the, uh, among others, uh, with um, with Eastman. I mean, uh, Eastman it was a pipeline over a thousand hundred uh, miles long and and uh, costing about seven billion. It was given special project status by the EU and was hailed as a boon to EU energy independence by the United States. And in an all, you know, the Biden administration did an about face and uh, no longer supports the uh, East Med. And I think with the situation as it, it's, it's developing in Ukraine, we might want to take a second look at, uh, at the East Med uh, because energy will become um, uh, one of the critical factors of, of, uh, of the next years. Um, uh, having said that, I, I, I do think that um, the thorny issues remain in, in the region, and, uh, and this, uh, these um, are the issues that both the previous speakers mentioned, uh, Islamic radicalism and uh, um, aggression and uh, uh, violation of, uh, of um, territorial sovereignty and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I do believe that what we are going to see symbolically, but also uh, uh, practically, we'll see a renewed interest and presence of the United States in the region because uh, Putin's Russia is not only um, uh, trying to uh, expand its dominance in its near abroad, but it's also, uh, it has also um, signaled its return, its effort to return in, in regions such as the Middle East, the Balkans, the East Med. And so we, we cannot leave a geopolitical and a political vacuum in the region. We need to be present. Uh, and because the, the new aggressive policies by the Putin regime will be, um, will be uh, uh, developed also in the, in the East Med region. I, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, uh, we'll turn to the q and Well, thank you to all our panelists for providing a diverse points of view, uh, but not necessarily disagreeing on uh, anything regarding the Eastern Mediterranean, and of which it all comes back to, unfortunately, that one country uh, called Turkey. Uh, and I don't believe in anything happens by accident. What happened in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, is not something that happened overnight. It's something that's been fermented for over 30 years. And you can also argue uh, when Cyprus, in, you know, 48 years ago, was another case where there was a legal invasion and a continuing occupation. And if you wanna substitute the words Erdogan with Putin uh, or Cyprus uh, with Ukraine, and all the elements are really the same. Uh, and I said earlier in my opening comments about the world order based on the rule of law. Uh, well, I think when we become selective in how we promote the rule of law and the world order amongst nations, uh, we tend to have the problems that we face here today. But our world is the Eastern Mediterranean for this discussion here today. And, and I am just one of those believers that uh, certainly uh, in the last uh, 10 years and certainly under Mr. Erdogan's uh, rule, uh, the area continues to be fraught with uh, insecurity uh, and instability where the countries of Greece, Cyprus and Israel are constantly doing the best they can to promote this peace and stability to project US interest. It is a NATO ally of Turkey that continues to create uh, uh, problems and now we'll see how they're going to continue to uh, operate within uh, their relationship with both Russia and Ukraine and controlling the very important entrance of the Dardanelles into the Black Sea. We have questions here from our audience, but let me get it started. Uh, and it's going to go directly uh, you know, to the, the heart in terms of where I, I'm concerned. So let me just uh, put this question out. In light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, partly driven by Putin's irredentism and historical revision, should the Biden administration be similarly concerned with President Erdogan, who is similarly driven by a revisionist desire to reconstitute a neo-Ottoman sphere of influence? What preemptive action should the administration take to ensure President Erdogan does, try to act, uh, does not try to act against Greece, Cyprus, or other countries in the region? 
we've seen uh, Erdogan in Turkey certainly uh, be uh, provocative. Uh, this is the last thing we need right now of a, of a NATO ally to continue to be, to be doing this. So what more should the administration be doing? Uh, and is there uh, this now notion again of how Turkey becomes important because of their geography, because of NATO uh, and their second largest army in NATO and so forth and so on? How would you respond? Um, I'll if I may. Um, one of the silver linings of the current crisis is that Europe is starting to take its own defense seriously again. And as the Germans, as others, increase the share of the de defense budget, um, the strength of Turkey's claim that they are the second largest NATO member may start to erode, simply because other countries will be able to bring assets to the table. The next point I would say is it's, it's important to be proactive rather than reactive. Turkey has defined itself over the past 20 years as wanting to sell itself to the highest bidder, to pivoting to that which it sees most strong rather than being ideologically consistent. So we shouldn't get involved into a dynamic in which we're forced to bid up the price of Turkish compliance. Uh, and in this case with Greece, we have a country that both left and right have concluded that it's in their interest to align much more closely with the West and so we should ride that as far as we can uh, for the mutual benefit, not only of Greece, uh, Cyprus, and the Eastern Mediterranean, but the broader Balkans as well. Anybody else want to comment? Doug? Yeah, one thought is that it might be worth Athens to, you know, presumably after we're through this crisis with uh, Ukraine, is to talk with its uh, European neighbors and note you know, this potential similarity. So I think Michael is right. One of the extraordinary things we're seeing, at least in the short term, and we hope that it will last, is a willingness of Europe to suddenly say, maybe we shouldn't expect Washington to do everything. Gee, maybe our defense is up to us. You know, with a rather extraordinary you know, Sunday speech by the German chancellor and uh, you know, some similar comments coming out of Liz Truss, the uh, trust or Truss in the uh, you know, foreign secretary in the UK. This might be an opportunity for Athens to talk to countries in Europe that until now have been too willing to kind of accept uh, you know, Turkish uh, activity and also frankly out of fear of uh, you know, refugees, et cetera, but to indicate with an election upcoming, I think we are entering potentially dangerous period with Turkey. If there's a time that Erdogan might try something, the, the coming year might be that time. He's in coalition with the, you know, the hardcore nationalists uh, you know, he lost, uh, you know, the, I mean, he, the, his party lost uh, Istanbul to a, a coalition of disaffected, you know, people across the range, but who are united more out of outrage at his behavior, the, you know, the HP's behavior in willing. So he may see foreign adventurism as being a means to gain votes next year. So I would, I would encourage Athens to, to the, what we've seen with you know, Russia and now, Ukraine is an example that one could imagine recurring, you know, down in you know, with Turkey. That's something European countries need to start thinking about. And in the U.S., I think it's very important to continue pressing home. Turkey is no longer the asset that people once thought it was. I think it's still kind of existing on this kind of historical aura of, you know, having been you know, the other the linchpin against the Soviets and providing us with necessary bases. And the, I think Constantine mentioned, I mean, this image of the, the model of Islamic democracy to kind of promote, well, all of that's gone. You know, and no one should have any illusions about all of that. And I just, I ask people, do you actually, are you sure if we had a NATO-Russian war, which side Turkey would come out on? I mean, would it be helpful? And I don't think they'd fight on behalf of Russia, but would they actually you know, help us or would they suddenly uh, be busy doing other things? You know, and we don't need that you know, at a time like this. We need to know who you can count on and who you can't. And that's a point we need to be making here in America is that you know, you know, Putin is showing us why it matters, whether you know, Turkey is a friend of his or a friend of ours. Yeah, go ahead, Kosa. You're muted. I'm muted. Just, just a brief comment. I, I, I fully agree on, on um, uh, Putin's successes. I mean, Putin's success with what he has done is to reunite the, the West. Uh, you know, he, he united again the transatlantic partnership uh, uh, that he had suffered over the last years. 
he united Europe. Uh, he gave NATO a new raison d'etre. I mean, we, we need to thank him for that. Besides all the, 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 the victims and the blood and the catastrophe that he has brought upon Europe. But we'd like to thank him because he, ma he made people in the West um, to rethink what we take for granted sometimes. So he reunited the West. And, uh, and, and that, in terms of defense, means um, um, many things. And, and the, and the U-turn by Germany is a very significant one, um, because uh, one of the, uh, of the problems in, um, in, in developing a European defense identity within, within the Atlantic Alliance, uh, I do believe that um, you know we, we the the, the uh, pendulum moved uh, widely from the European dependence upon the uh, American security umbrella to the Europeans talking about European strategic autonomy. I think we need to talk about strategic complementarity, and we need a new Atlantic Charter that would that would that would help the Europeans spend more on defense because they've been free riders for a long time. They would, that would make the Europeans take upon more missions and have a better decision-making on, on, on uh, issues that um, have to do with the Eurasian continent. This new Atlantic Charter brings, bring, brings all European countries back to the fold, uh, starting with Germany. And one of the problems uh, with Turkey was Germany's position. Now, going back to Erdogan and Turkey, I do think that um, uh, you know Turkey tried in the initial um, days of this crisis to, again to play uh, the evasive neutral kind of uh, of, of model, but it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, in in days of war, you need to make choices, uh, and 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 so I, my guess is that we're going to see Erdogan's leadership uh, um, to try to veer towards the West. Um, now, having said that, um, many people do believe that, you know, um, uh, Turkey has a geopolitical significance, uh, it's a geopolitical hint, there's no question about that. However, if Turkey, um, in, 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 this, uh, in the dawn of this new era and this new Cold War, uh, wants to return to the um, uh, Western orthodoxy, it will have to do so uh, by the rules of the uh, of the West, by the rules of democracy, by the rules of respect of uh, uh, international law, regulations, territorial integrity, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think there is uh, there is a lot of leverage on uh, on the American administrations uh, if they want to keep uh, uh, Turkey in a Western orbit. Uh, to make Turkey uh, adhere to these rules of the liberal order, because this is what um, the new dividing line is going to be. Uh, the liberal order, democracies versus authoritarianism. If I may just follow up, uh, I guess now about two weeks ago, I believe it was uh, Ambassador Greenfield, a US ambassador to the United Nations and a Security Council meeting uh, said to uh, our counterpart, the Russian ambassador, something to the effect, how would you like to have 100,000 troops on your border? This is prior to the invasion. Well, again, I, I, I keep hate to keep using the parallel of Ukraine because it's just dramatic what we see there today. And I don't want to underplay what's happening there, but you have to use comparisons of what's happening, what happened before. It's only fair and we have to do that. Well, today, there are 43,000 approximately NATO troops occupying Cyprus. This is an EU country. This is 2022 as well. Uh, the, the US State Department still does not acknowledge this as an invasion. I believe they call it an incursion. We were all quick to condemn what transpired in Ukraine as, an, as it rightfully was an illegal invasion. So how can we reconcile how can we reconcile today? Because as soon as this crisis, and hopefully this you know, uh, abates very soon, and Erdogan is back to his business as usual of two-state solutions, encroachment on the fenced off area of Arosha, uh, and the possibility of actual annexation of the occupied area with Turkey. And you, uh, Mr. Rubin said, 
it's better to prevent a crisis than to have to react to a crisis. So this is hasn't you know eluded you know Mr. Erdogan's uh, thinking. He's just weighing again for the time to act again. And by the way, while all this is going on in Ukraine, there are still violations every single day. And in reading reports this year alone, the numbers have been through the roof. No pun intended regarding air violations of Greek sovereign air territory. So how can we, what should, and again, the EU, first and foremost, they should be involved. It's their territory that's being occupied by Turkey through Cyprus. And what United States policy should be of a country that now they proclaim to have a strategic partnership with. What should we do, okay, to once and for all say, hey, this was an illegal invasion, get your troops off of Cyprus, okay, and make Cyprus once and for all whole free and at peace. Please. Um, very briefly, I want to highlight what Doug had said before. Um, paraphrasing, it's important to calibrate U.S. policy to the reality of the country rather than um, the perception of what that country once was. And part of that is we've seen, for example, with regard to the Armenian Genocide Resolution, a willingness of Congress to break new ground here. And there's no reason why Congress can't take the lead. Remember, and State Department diplomats hate when you say this, but it's not the job of state, the State Department to make U.S. foreign policy. It's the job of Congress. And if Congress is much more proactive and marks the anniversary of the invasion of Cyprus as just that, marks the occupation of Cyprus as just that, and calls upon the State Department, it will fundamentally, um, to acknowledge that, it will fundamentally um, begin to change the conversation. And of course, within the Senate, this can also be done during confirmation hearings and, and so forth, to get people on the record acknowledging this. Or, um, so at least if they try to weasel out of it later, we can call them what they are, which is liars. Um, and so there is there is enough within the, um, it, it, let me just conclude with this. It's going to take the Congress being much more activist in the way in which it was for better or worse in the 1980s, rather than deferring itself as a minor branch of government, rather than a co-equal branch of government. No, I don't disagree there. And if you, and if you certainly look over the course of the last couple of years, the majority of, of action regarding Eastern Mediterranean and regarding Turkey has come out of the Congress and has not come from anywhere else. And, and very quickly, Nick, I'm sorry to cut in on other people. What's also important to acknowledge is what's happening in Cyprus, what's happening in Greece, doesn't, it, it's not just about Cyprus and Greece. Um, I travel around the region and I see Turkish forces occupying portions of Iraq. When Turkish is, um, when Erdogan is being revisionist as to his borders, it's not just about um, Bulgaria or Greece. It's also about Mosul. Um, I, when I was in Nagorno-Karabakh um, two weeks after the, the guns fell silent a year ago, um, a year ago, December. And what many Americans don't realize is that a surprise attack on Nagorno-Karabakh happened on the 100th anniversary of the Ottoman attack on the independent um, Armenia. So this wasn't by coincidence. The fact of the matter is, and you're part of this, is that, uh, I mean, successfully, is that there's a growing coalition in Congress, not just uh, the American Hellenic Institute, but also the Iraqis, also the Armenians, also the Kurds, all of whom similar um, victimization. And the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so I want to commend you and the AHI for what you're doing to reach across, um, um, reach beyond your traditional constituencies. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Doug? I think there are two points, one of which I think Michael is very, he's very right about the importance of Congress. And you know, as the indication of you know, what the Turkish you know, American caucus is today versus what it once was, you know, that Turkey no longer has that strong bipartisan support, that it, you know, its conduct has eroded it. And that uh, you know, that needs to be made very clear to people, that you know, people who once viewed Turkey as the political juggernaut, it no longer is. And the second is, it is interesting, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, it might be one word to use, of how often <laughs> Turkey seems to be working with adversaries of the United States. I mean, again, the intervention in Syria is against the Syrian Kurdish you know, forces that the US worked with against ISIS. I mean, these folks were very helpful. I mean, threats against uh, you know, uh, Kurdistan. I mean, this is the area of uh, you know, Iraq that turned out to be 
I mean, number one, they're the target of ISIS and fought ISIS down when they were taking out you know, Yazidis and others. It turned, it's been a, a refuge for Christians and others fleeing you know, Islamist violence. You know, it's been threatened by Iran. I mean, Iran's activity in Libya, I mean, complicated situation there, but you know, as far as say, Turkey did not go into Libya to help people that we would necessarily want to help. This activities with uh, you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan. I mean, all of these are places where we see Turkey taking up a very malign role, as well as its potential relationship with, with Russia. So I think this needs to be pointed out to folks that there's a, a pattern here. And uh, I think the, they do not react the way they should on Cyprus because in some sense, what's well, an old intervention that it happened during the Cold War, we're just kind of used to it. You know, if it had happened last week, you know, people would be much more excited about it, and they'd see visual on TV the depredations of Turkish troops. But it needs to be brought forth to people that this is this was an early aspect of a, a pattern today, that we see Turkey involved in places that it shouldn't, using its military force in ways that it shouldn't. You know, this should be treated as an ongoing atrocity, not an old one. All right, let me go to some. Uh questions here. Some of them are very long. Folks, send in short uh, questions if you can. But uh, here's one uh, as it pertains to religious freedom. It says, what can the United States do to better in consultation with its Mediterranean allies to address religious freedom violations in Turkey, especially regarding the Hockey Seminary, uh, uh, which is being closed illegally since 1971 by the Turkish government? Anybody want to take a stab at that? You know, it's not easy to, I mean, there's a lot of religious violation, freedom violations in a lot of countries. One thing the administration turned down was the U.S. Commission on uh, International Religious Liberty recommended uh, putting uh, Turkey on a special watch list, which uh, kind of heightened scrutiny of their activities because of its violations. The administration turned that down. That would be one way to do so. I, I mean, it, it raises the profile of Turkey as a violator of religious liberty. It irritates the Turks, but that's fine. They should realize somebody's watching on this. I mean, you know, turning the uh, Hagia Sophia back into a mosque. I mean, there are a number of issues over the in recent years that we've seen with kind of the increasing Islamization of Turkey. And that would be one thing that I would advocate. And, you know, the commission promoted, I'd like to see the administration do. Um, if I could just jump in very quickly, a lot of scholars at Cato have done some very good work on the tendency to, uh, for the United States to default to sanctions and to over-sanction. That said, we need to recognize that sometimes sanctions do work. We saw this with the release of Pastor Andrew Brunson, if they're done very specifically and precisely and for very specific reasons, for example, for freeing the Halki Seminar perhaps in the future. Um, you've got a situation where we could do something like that there. Also, in um, uh, one issue where um, Cato and um, the American Enterprise Institute, even though neither of us take truly institutional positions, have often clashes with regard to sanctions with regard to Iran. But while the public debate is with regard to what our government should do, much more powerful is oftentimes the reputational um, um, concerns which individual companies have. And this is something that any White House can utilize, any congressman can utilize from their own bully pulpits without calling into action uh, formal sanctioning mechanisms is to uh, highlight just what is going on in a way where some U.S. companies are trying, um, where U.S. companies are now doing with regard to Ukraine uh, and Russia and where some people are calling on U.S. companies to do with regard to, um, to what's going on with the Uyghurs in China. Don't underestimate the power of uh, company se sensitivity to reputational damage and if we can get major American corporations to start uh, addressing these issues, all the better. Okay, here's a question from uh, William Janus, adjunct professor at Fordham Law School. He said, will China's uh, BRI 16 plus one initiative, if I'm saying that right, and European port investments serve as a potential mitigating factor in the Black Sea Mediterranean Sea region as the three seas initiative enhanced peace and prosperity in the region. I see we all know exactly what he's referring to here. <laughs> well, the, 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 BRI, oh, sorry. Uh, the BRI, of course, has its own set of controversies. 
uh, you know, in terms of uh, the U.S. and other, some of the European countries have concern about China financing and being involved in managing, uh, you know, critical projects like ports. So, I mean, you know, kind of having Chinese investment can be useful. On the other hand, where it goes in, what kind of projects, what kind of strings are attached, raises issues. I mean, the Three Seas Initiative, I think, in principle, is good. I mean, of course, you're, you're going from the Baltic down to the Balkans you're dealing with a lot of different countries. I mean, some of the initiatives like a highway and I think a, a natu maybe a natural gas pipeline make a lot of sense if you could connect these regions. You know, other areas of development might be more difficult, again, because th this is a very real mix of countries. I don't know the kind of their record particularly well. You know, I wish them well in terms of what they do. Um, I, I would just add, I largely agree with Doug, that after the relative, um, disasters in terms of sovereignty for uh, Sri Lanka losing its port as collateral uh, for Pakistan with regard to um, Gwadar, Pakistan's basically become a wholly owned subsidiary of China and Djibouti, um, where now you have 80% um, of the GDP, um, Chinese debt, oh, debt owed to China is equivalent to 80% of the GDP. You've got a situation where many countries are simply becoming much more cautious and that um, that mitigates the ability of China to leverage itself, especially in regions that um, are more democratic and have at least a better history of um, financial transparency. Just, just if I may a, a, a comment on that, I mean, you know, the BRI was a very grandiose uh, geopolitical design on the part of China. I mean, the only similar design that comes to mind of that magnitude is the Marshall Plan and Truman Doctrine and so on and so forth. But uh, as both the previous speakers indicated, that came um, with a lot of uh, IOUs. I mean, the Chinese would come and give loans and penetrate the infrastructure of countries, and there has been a lot of pushback. But when it comes to Europe, the Chinese tried to do something that the um, Europeans didn't understand that, uh, uh, early in the game, and that was to strike bilateral deals with countries like uh, Italy, Greece, um, and Hungary, and so on and so forth. And, and, and that led the commission to come out of the uh, strategic document in 2018, 2019, and, and, and make sure that um, uh, there, there, there is a streamlined process that every member state adheres to the, the, the rules and the directives of the European Commission when it comes to striking deals with China. So there is a new way of looking at um, Chinese uh, imports and the BRI uh, uh, efforts to penetrate Europe. And there has been a streamlining process to, 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 to deal with that. This, uh, we've gone over the time limit and this will be the last uh, question. And this comes uh, from a colleague of yours, uh, Costa. Elizabeth Prodromo, she states, George Kennan in 2009 wrote that Congress decision to enlarge NATO as quote, the most faithful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era, end quote. Why do we have a compressed timeline that doesn't take into account the factors leading up to this tragic war? Isn't it important to think about the three decade lead that helps to understand how we got here and therefore the prudence or lack thereof of inviting Sweden and Finland to join NATO? You want me to answer that? Well, like yeah, all, I will. all of you, I'm sure, have a comment on this. Yeah, I will. Uh, if you if you like me to, I will. Uh, look, um, the um, the dual uh, policy of enlargement, the enlargement of the EU and, and NATO, uh, was um, as much a policy designed by the United States as it was uh, a response to the demands of the newly liberated countries that saw the European Union as a guarantee to their Develop, economic development and their newly found democratic institutions, and they saw NATO as a response to their security concerns. In 1998, I went on a fact-finding mission uh, in, uh, in Budapest, Warsaw, and Prague. Uh, this was the first, I think, wave of um, uh, countries that would become members of NATO. And I interviewed almost everyone, from citizens to policymakers to opinion makers. And they were saying one theme. They were uttering one theme. What about uh, if Russia turns nationalistic and revanchist? What is the guarantee for our freedom and our security? So I, I do believe that it was the right policy. 
It was a policy that responded to the needs of these countries. Let's not forget, we fought a Cold War to liberate those countries that fell behind the Iron Curtain. Now, when it comes to the former Soviet republics like Ukraine or Georgia, maybe the, this is an overage. Maybe uh, one can, can talk about an overage here. But to talk about the policy of NATO enlargement as, um, as a, 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 almost you know, a, something that instigated Putin's behavior, I, I would say it's the other way around. And I would, I would add to that that it's not what Putin is engaged in is not about his security concerns. It has nothing to do with uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO. Putin cannot stand to have a functional, free, democratic nation state in his borders. He, because as, as an agent, a KGB agent in Dresden, he saw what happened in, in a dysfunctional autocratic state as East Germany was when it bordered a, a, a functional free democracy that West Germany was. And so he cannot stand to have a democracy in his border. That's his problem and, and his imperial Russian designs. It has nothing to do with Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, Doug or Michael? Um. Doug and I could probably debate um, for another hour the, the question, um, and I don't want to do that. I, I tend to agree with the professor a little bit more, suffice to say. Um, but one other element, I do think it's important to ask, uh, while I disagree with George Keenan, I do think it's important to ask why now? Why not next year? Why not uh, 2013 or 2012? So two patterns come to mind. First of all, I agree that Ukraine's biggest mistake was bordering Russia, um, not that they could do much about it. But when you had Azerbaijan in 1992 try to go um, democratic under Elchebay, uh, they lost a chunk of their territory in Nagorno-Karabakh. In Georgia, the chunk of territory was lost to Abkhazia and South Ossetia after the Rose Revolution. Again, stigmatizing the Georgians and symbolizing what happens if you try to go democratic. The same thing was going on um, with Ukraine prior to this in 2014. Also with Armenia, after um, Pashinyan came into power, suddenly now Armenia is losing Nagorno-Karabakh. The symbol is clear. You go democratic and you're going to lose a chunk of your territory. But there's another factor at play here, which we often don't discuss, which is um, whatever you think of what justifies Russia's actions, when it moves into new territory, it's got to um, subsidize that territory. Now, Russians, I mean, my wife, um, Anna Borshevskaya, is an analyst at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and she's written uh, how many Russians have referred to Vladimir Putin in terms of his economic management, in terms of stagnation, as a new Leonid Brezhnev. Now, when you have that stagnation, you distract people by military adventure, but then when you seize territory, you need to subsidize it. And that doesn't actually help. That worsens your economic situation, which speeds up the cycle. And I'm afraid uh, that that's where we are now. Um, Russia is in such dire financial straits. It's got an economy less than that of Italy, just slightly more than that of Spain, that you're in a situation that it's spending more and more money. Vladimir Putin, uh, because of the corruption, can't manage the, uh, and because of his lack of will, can't manage the economy. And so he's going to go for more distraction, whether that's Kazakhstan, Moldova, or God forbid the Baltics. I think that's on the horizon. Doug? Yeah, there's, this is obviously, I mean, in fact, uh, an issue that came up during my earlier uh, you know, <laughs> you know, webinar with uh, Michael's wife, Anna. Um, like, this, I mean, in my view, there's no doubt that this played a role. Uh, and it's, it's hardly the only thing, but there were a lot of assurances that were given. We have declassified documents of a lot of folks of things that were said, but it's not alone. I mean, I think this is one of those issues where over time we saw a change of opinion within Russia, not just elites, but also popular, especially after the Western intervention that Dakar, you know, broke Kosovo off of Serbia. Serbia is a historic Russian interest. A lot of Russians were offended by that, and it really highlighted how little power and influence they had. You know, the color revolutions in, uh, in both uh, you know, Ukraine and Georgia, and then the 2014, the Maidan revolution, 
you know, against an elected though corrupt president who had been relatively pro-Russian. All of that together, and I think this is where strategic empathy plays a role. It's, it's the question is not what we intend, it's how it's perceived. And it was perceived badly. I mean, and Putin talked about this long ago. I think these are real concerns. Back in 2007, his speech at the Munich Security Conference, he brought these up, including the fact that the US was really very active militarily I mean, he, he talked after the debacle in Iraq and after Afghanistan, you know, that what they saw was a very militarily active United States. Plus, you know, and again, none of this justifies what he's done, but I think it helps explain what was going on. And I think we missed that. And unfortunately, having missed that, we got ourselves into this situation. But it strikes me kind of that was then, this is now. I mean, I just want to emphasize nothing he's done you know, in Ukraine can be justified by you know, whatever complaints he had. And to my mind, in a sense, the question of, we, we've passed the point where what, you know, the question of Finland and Sweden, that having gotten this war, what Putin has done, I think as Costas, you know, mentioned, is united Europe and NATO. You know, so I would agree in a sense with the concerns in the past. I have a hard time today saying, well, gee, we shouldn't let them in because I don't know, it might upset Russia. Well, we're kind of past that point. Uh, and to my mind, the what we need to do now, and this is well beyond, of course, what we can talk about at this seminar, how do we get out of this? How do we get out of this without a Cold War? How do we get out of this without Russia being, in, in a sense, a massive North Korea? You know, very large, sanctioned, isolated, angry hatred, you know, run by a, a dictator who you know, we worry about, you know, how rational he might be. I mean, that's the frightening thing. And that's where we have, to, how do we get out of this? How do we get out of this so that Ukraine remains free? I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to have a neutral Ukraine if that can solve this, but Ukraine has to be free. It has, people have to be able to create the government they want. They have to be able to <laughs> trade with who they want. So we need to be thinking about that now. What is the end game? I mean, the, the immediate term is how do you help Ukraine? The longer term thing is how do we end this? To my mind, that is the critical thing. That's going to require good diplomacy, thoughtful diplomacy. It's going to require some kind, I mean, deterrence. I mean, there are a number of things that come into this. And I just hope we can, we, we, that's what we've got to be focused on. So I am scared about an end game, an end game where he wins in the sense of conquering Ukraine, has a long-term insurgency there, and they're brutally try to re, you know, repress it, where his country is isolated with as many nuclear weapons as America, you know, willing to go on nuclear alert and threaten us. I mean, this is not a world we want to be in. You know, so uh, it's a very not a very positive thing to end on. I'm sorry, but you know, that that to me is the crisis now. Well, my 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 brain says I should end right here while I'm ahead, but I just can't. So, <laughs> so if I may, uh, and of course that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. And now the genie is out of the bottle. How we put him back in is going to be uh, a very difficult road and. For the good of mankind, maybe I hope we're able to uh, contain this to the best of our abilities and uh, come out of this with some positive end game uh, that somehow I guess everybody's going to have to save face. But I have a question. Uh, you know, in hindsight, is twenty twenty, but it, this has always bothered me. And since I got such esteemed panelists here, I really like to hear your opinion. And I know this probably can open up a whole can of worms and go on for another hour, but a very short you know, maybe yes or no answer. Uh, and the crude analogy is, you know, what do you do to your body when you're in your 20s in terms of what you put in it, you know, ultimately pays uh, very badly negatively, you know, when you're in your 50s. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, did we do a good enough job in the West in terms of what was the next step? If we had embraced the Soviet Union, well, Russia, when it became Russia, and it collapsed and brought him into the fold, maybe not necessarily making part of the European Union because that would have made him the bigger you know, member and so forth and members of parliaments in the European Union that creates all sorts of other issues. But if we embrace them, even invite them to be part of NATO, this never would have given rise, in my opinion, to the circumstances that we have here today, including you know, guys like Putin who wore KGB operatives and come from that mindset. And that's the ideology they know. And that's what they're trying to promote here today. So I guess the question is, did we do what we should have done in terms of embracing and bringing into the fold, into the Western 
fold uh, the, after the fall of the Soviet Union? Nick, Nick um, I'll be very brief. Um, the former chess grandmaster and Russian opposition figure Gary Kasparov published a book, I think it was in 2016, called Winter is Coming, in which he addressed that issue head on and he basically argued uh, that yes, the West was more than generous to Russia. Um, for example, it compelled Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan to give up the legacy nuclear weapons, um, preserving Russian dominance there. Now, none of the other states could have fired the Russian nuclear weapons, but they could have used the, um, the, the material for their own uh, ends and so forth. Um, I do think we need to recognize that Vladimir Putin has an ideology, that the Russians have agency, and that everything Russia is doing isn't necessarily in reaction to us, but as a proactive desire to fulfill. And then the question is, if you um, undermine the liberty of or compromise upon the liberty of other peoples simply to make the Russians feel better after what essentially was one of the 20th century's greatest colonialist empires. Would it really have assuaged Russia or would we simply have had a situation where rather than fighting in Ukraine, we'd be fighting in Poland or in East Germany? Uh, yeah, um, I fully agree on the issue of agency. And let me give you another historical example. The great European powers that were the superpowers of the 19th century, when they lost two catastrophic wars, they, they, they changed path and they engaged in constructing a democratic liberal order. They found another role in the international system, okay? Russia never found another role after the Cold War. It never, befriended itself with the need for a new role. This is the issue. The West, did, did the West make mistakes? Sure we did. But the, are those mistakes to blame for what has happened uh, to Russia and the war in Ukraine? Hell no. Doug, did you uh, have anything to add? Well, look, look, given what happened, I think one would say, I guess we could have done better. But <laughs> I hesitate blaming policymakers at the time. I mean, you know, Michael and Kostas are right. I mean, the, the Russians had agency. Look, Boris Yeltsin was a hero in facing down tanks uh, you know, with the attempted coup. On the other hand, would you want to endorse how he governed? Would you want to endorse his mental state? You know, the tr I mean, we had a tragedy there. Somebody who in many ways was very well-intentioned, but by the end was not giving us good government, or giving, more importantly, not giving Russians good government and who appointed Vladimir Putin essentially to, to replace him. You know, made him prime minister, which turned him into acting president from which he got elected president. Um, you know, I mean, this Yeltsin, you know, I mean, the, the whole economic crash, the, you know, we, we basically did our best to buy the election for him because he was way behind the communist candidate. So badly was he perceived as governing. So, so you know, I think it's very, I mean, I think the U.S. and the allies made mistakes, but again, I don't think we, the, the Russians made decisions, Putin made decisions, others made decisions. So, you know, I don't think we should spend our time blaming whether it be George H.W. Or, or the Clinton administration or somebody else. To my mind, the past is past. Let's try to learn from it. The question is, what do we do today? And to me, and that is the real crisis that we've got to deal with. If I could just circle back really quickly and agree with Doug for a moment, um, you've got a situation where even though Yeltsin was weak, he did start the basic work of creating a system. Um, what Putin has done is eviscerate that system and cut off anyone at the knees who might be competent enough to rise up and challenge him. Now, every Democrat wakes up knowing when his term in office is over. Every dictator wakes up realizing that today could be his last. And the real danger looking forward, and this is where Doug's North Korea analogy is apt, is that unlike North Korea, I mean, Russia could be even more simply because there's no clear line of succession. And so what's going to happen when Putin dies and you have a complete and other vacuum with all those nuclear weapons and other technologies at their disposal? Unfortunately, for too often in Russian history, that extreme nationalism has been the manna, it's been the destroyer not unlike Turkey. Well, gentlemen, uh, I, I certainly thank you for this very uh, extraordinary and dynamic discussion here today. We will have to leave it at that. 
And as they say, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but there's a lot at stake here right now, not least of which is the humanitarian crisis that has befallen the people of Ukraine. And we certainly wish them the best. And obviously, as they all say, our prayers and thoughts are with them. But we certainly hope that end game, as Doug alluded to, comes quickly uh, and this thing is contained and does not spread into other countries where we have catastrophic uh, you know, uh, possibilities that could occur. So we will leave it at that. I thank you once again. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in. I'd like to thank, of course, uh, our, our sponsor for today, James Lagos of Springfield, Ohio. And I'd like to thank our uh, producer and our in-house uh, assistant here, Dimos Theofanopoulos, uh, for helping to organize uh, today's Zoom presentation. We look forward to having you at another event in the near future. In the meantime, God bless everyone, keep safe, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, and thank you once again to our panelists.